I read all of The Gray Man, volumes 1 through 28, in one week. Here are my thoughts. Have you ever thought about wanting to do a full series review and you're not really sure how to start the video so you just kind of did something that you've never done before and then you hope it works? Well, that's me today. Hello everybody, this is That Manga Dude and welcome to my first ever full series review. And it is a big one. I... <laughs> Interesting interesting thing about this video specifically is when I was coming up with the first series that I wanted to do a full review of, I actually wanted to do a series um, that one is a little bit shorter, like at least like somewhat shorter, uh, you know, not like one piece levels of length or like not even like Haikyuu because Haikyuu is pretty long. It's about 45 volumes. So I was looking for something between 25 to 30 volumes. Um, and yeah, what I ended up landing on was the gray man of all things. So <laughs> Yeah, so I read all of The Gray Man, volumes 1 through 28 in English, um, as of, I guess, I guess November 2023. Um, funny enough, when I was playing this out, I didn't even know, or I didn't even remember that The Gray Man, volume 28, was coming out in November. It just happened to be, uh, while I was thinking about it in October, I'm like, man, it'd be really funny if I did, like, a full series review of The Gray Man, uh, a series that I'm notoriously not the biggest fan of, or at least when I first read it, this was, like, over a decade ago. So I think that's also what led me to making this review, was, uh, giving it a second chance and seeing if, like, my harshness towards the series was led more because of a variety of different factors which I will be getting into as soon as I'm done with this little intro here. So, um, yeah, let's get started. We have ourselves The Gray Man. It is uh, currently at 248 to 249 chapters. I'm not sure exactly um, because I have differing sources on the internet. Um, but this series first premiered in Weekly Shonen Jump in May of 2004. So this series has been going strong for 19 years now, um, <laughs> which is actually crazy to say. Um, the manga is Story and Arts by Katsura Hoshino, who has been working on this series, like I said, for 19 years now. And it is just absolutely insane that this series has been as long as it has been uh, for a variety of reasons. I, I think one, because she's had to take a lot of breaks and there's been a lot of like, um, I think there's a lot of parts for the story, like she just needed to like figure it out. So um, yeah, let's get right into it. So talking about my first impressions originally of The Gray Man. So uh, back when I first read The Gray Man in uh, what feels like ages ago now, I think it was like 2008, 2009 is what, around the time that I started reading it. I thought it was really flippin' cool. I really enjoyed the characters. I thought the story was pretty neat. Um, and yeah, overall, the art was nice, and I was like, I'm just gonna keep reading this. Uh, I really like the characters and stuff, so uh, decided to keep reading it. And we got to around, I think it was around volume 22 or 23 back in um, like 2011, 2012. And I remember I was starting to get fatigued by it. I was starting to buy these volumes. Uh, it was during a time where I wasn't really working. I was still in high school. Um, and it was getting to that point where I was like, man, is it even worth buying these volumes? I'm spending $10 on these and I'm reading through them in like a half an hour. Um, so it started to become more of like kind of that kind of stuff. Like, was it worth buying these volumes if I wasn't liking the series so much. I would be spending my money on, you know, series that I actually really enjoy, uh, whether that was One Piece or whether that was, like, Death Note or anything like that during the time. So I decided to put a hold on the Gray Man, and I had been holding this kind of, like, mini grudge towards the series, thinking, like, wow, this series is just not that great. I don't get what all the hype is about. I don't really understand it. Um, and I, I think that was a harsh uh, critique at the time, uh, but that's also why I decided to reread it. So let's get into the review fully now. Okay, so the way I'm going to conduct this review, it's going to be in three parts. So first, I'm going to be talking about the story, then I'm going to be talking about the characters, and then I'm going to be talking about the art. So, uh, let's talk about the story uh, about as detailed as I can get without being, like, overly detailed or overly descriptive about it. Uh, obviously, this is going to be a full spoiler alert series uh, or series review, so please keep that in mind if you do want to read The Gray Man. I would highly suggest not watching this video unless you have already read it or you do not care to have spoilers throughout this entire video. But now that that's done, let's get started. So The Gray Man follows the story of a young man. His name is Alan Walker, who is 15 at the beginning of this series. Uh, we come to find out that he is going to become an exorcist, or at least that's what his um, teacher slash mentor, his name is Cross Marion, is telling him to do. Go become, go become um, an exorcist for a group called the Black Order. Um, Alan has this weird looking thing on his left arm. And what it is, is you come to find out it's this thing called Innocence. And Innocence is basically like this uh, kind of like, 
material, I guess is the best way to put it. It's a, basically a holy material. And if you are like the, basically the person who can control it, um, then you become an exorcist. And then you can have like all these special abilities. Uh, everybody has like a different kind of innocence and a different kind of use for it. They're also known as accommodators. That's what the word was. I don't know why I was blanking on it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so Alan, you come to find out he has one uh, on his arm, and his arm can like basically transform into this giant clawed hand, which he doesn't have a name for, at least at the beginning of the series, but it comes, you come later, which I will be discussing in a little bit. So Alan joins the Black Order, and we meet a, a variety of fun characters. We get ourselves Lena Lee, we get Yukonda, we get Lavi, we get the Bookman, uh, we get Komui. We get, there's so many characters that get introduced uh, pretty quickly, actually. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, I just wanted to say that like it does happen pretty fast. I think within the first two to three volumes you get introduced to a lot of characters. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're not a big fan of that kind of stuff. But as we proceed on, we come to find out that the, the Black Order is basically fighting against the Millennium Earl, who is this guy here on the front, who is the leader of like this evil group. Um, he's supposed to bring the end of the world in a way. He's following his own prophecy where he has to gather together uh, a bunch of these people called the Noah and is trying to find this thing called the Heart, which is supposed to be like the most powerful innocence. It's the innocence that is supposed to defeat the Millennium Earl. So he's trying to find it and destroy it so that he has a chance of being able to take over slash destroy the world so it's a fight between the black order and the millennium Earl and the clan of noah as i was mentioning the clan of noah is basically um i, I would say is a substitute for the 12 disciples uh basically there are 13 um people in the clan of noah uh, they are basically these people who follow the Millennium Earl no matter what. They uh, have a variety of abilities slash um, kind of like personality traits that were connected to the original Noah, uh, which is, yes, the Noah from the Old Testament. If you don't know about the Noah from the Old Testament, uh, basically he was the man that built the ark, uh, brought the two pairs or the pairs of animals onto the boat, brought in his family, and survived the Great Flood that killed off literally everyone but his family himself. Uh, and then he was made to populate the world once again uh, with the animals and with his family. So, um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of connections here and a lot of, like, obviously religious stuff, uh, of course, as, as you would hopefully expect from an Exorcist series, um, or at least specifically with a um, European Exorcist series. Uh, just as a note, the series does take place mostly in Europe, but it really is all over the place. Uh, which is great. You get parts in the Asia branch, you get parts in China and Japan, um, also parts obviously in Europe, like I mentioned. Uh, so very interesting series in that aspect. Um, but as we continue on, m like the Millennium Earl obviously is trying to take over and we get a variety of parts into the story. We meet Yukonda. Konda, Yukonda is basically this dude um, who has like kind of an attitude problem with Alan. Uh, really doesn't like him, but they go on their first mission together, uh, and they find out that like oh like they have like he has a unique sword ability and some kind of healing ability. You're not really sure about it yet. But as we continue, uh, we get sent on an Alan slash Lenali mission. We get some more information between them. Uh, you get to find out about Lenali's ability, and we meet a character named Miranda Lotto, who is this uh, girl or late this lady. Sorry, she's not a girl. <laughs> Um, she's an older lady, or older lady in comparison to most of the exes. She's in her 20s, I believe. Um, and she has the ability to kind of rewind time, basically. Um, and we continue on. We keep meeting new characters. We meet Lavi, like I said. Um, and then we get sent into our, our next big arc, where they're on the search for Cross Marion. Cross Marion is one of the generals, like I mentioned, also one of the mentors of Alan. And they're coming to try to find him because there has been attacks on the generals, uh, because it is believed that the generals may have the uh, heart, like I mentioned previously. So they're sent to go find out, or they're sent to go find Cross Marion. Alan's like, I really don't want to see him again, which I will be discussing during the character um, part or character portion of this video. So they get sent on this. We meet a variety of extra characters as well. We get Cal Crory, or also known as Aristar Crory, is coming in. Um, we get to meet some of the actual Noah for the first time. We, we meet Rode a little bit earlier, but we actually get introduced to Tiki Mick. So Tiki Mick is going to be like one of the, I would say one of the main antagonists uh, from the clan of Noah and probably one of the most important in terms of Alan's development as a character throughout the story. Um, but he basically turns one of the people into a, 
what is it, a fallen one, I believe is what they're called. Uh, yes, a fallen one. So Suman, who was also an exorcist at one time, uh, turns into a fallen one. A fallen one is basically like a fallen angel, I think is the best way to describe it. But it's basically if a person um, with a less than 0% synchro uh, synchronization, uh, which is important for people who will become exorcists, that the higher your synchronization rate, the stronger your innocence is. Um, so if they're less than 0% synchronization and they're merged with an innocence, they become a fallen one, which is basically this uber powerful thing, uh, entity is the best way to put it, and they blow things up. So Sumon causes a lot of problems, uh, a lot of characters uh, have history with him, uh, specifically Lena Lee, and uh, yeah, so we get this really emotional moment, I would say, one of, probably one of the biggest emotional moments in the beginning of the series, uh, where we get to see, like, the atrocities of war, how there's been like some things going on in the background, especially with the Black Order, that just doesn't seem to be like sitting right uh, with a couple of our characters. A couple of our characters start to question uh, the Black Order itself and what it's doing uh, and how it's affecting the people around them. So we continue on, we get to meet uh, people from the Asia branch. Uh, Alan basically gets his <laughs> innocence destroyed uh, and has to try to uh, recuperate it as we were proceeding through the story. This is a really cool part because we get to see Alan at his lowest, which is something that, not necessarily that we get to see often in Shonen series, but it's really, really interesting because this is like genuinely one of the lowest moments he's had because he like actually is um, basically useless to the Black Order because you know the whole point of the Black Order for at least with the Exodus is that they have to use innocence, but because his innocence is destroyed, he can't do anything. So this is just a really interesting moment. I think this was a really good moment in the series. Uh, happens right towards like right before like the middle of the series. So uh, really great development there. We continue on, we get to meet some more, like I said, of the Asia, uh, Asia branch, get to learn more about the Innocence, we get to learn more about how like it's created, uh, what the Black Order is doing with the Innocence, because sometimes they are trying to do experiments with the Innocence, which cause a lot of problems, which I will be discussing later down into the story. So, uh, we finally get to fight, our, we finally get a fight between the uh, level 3 Akuma, as you, as I have not mentioned already, but basically the Akuma are stacked into three, like four different levels. Um, spoiler alert with the level four but uh up until this point of the story like right before the level three fight we only know about the level ones and the level twos the level ones are like the basic akuma people the akuma uh which i should have mentioned earlier are these basically these monsters that are created by um our boy the millennium earl <laughs> and uh they're used to turn other people into akuma and or just cause like wanton destruction they're really bad um but the way they work is like you take the soul um, you take the soul of a person and you put it into like this skeleton thing um, and basically they are created by the plight of people. So like if people have really strong emotions or are really sad about something, the Millennium Earl basically tricks them into sticking the soul into something which creates the Akuma. Um, <laughs> it's, really, it's really screwed up. And something I'm going to be discussing more as we continue on with the story. Uh, but basically, yeah, the Akuma, as they proceed to cause damage and do a variety of things, uh, the more they eat, the stronger they become. So uh, as they become level 2s, they become a bit stronger and they're a little bit difficult for uh, Alan at the beginning, but they become pretty easy. Then they introduce a level 3, and the level 3s are very strong. They do a ton of damage. They they tend to have like their own kind of personality to them. Uh, and they will just cause a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of problems. But um, this fight's pretty epic. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really cool. And then we continue on. We start to learn more. Uh, we get to meet a variety of other level 3s. Uh, we finally get to Japan because Alan finally fixes his, like, um, his innocence uh, and becomes the crown clown is what his his innocence his name is or at least what he calls it um, so then he joins up with this the crew over in Japan uh, where they have a, a, a supposedly have found cross Marion we get to see like a variety of fights uh, with all of the characters for the most part and a lot of things just get screwed up um, it's really bad but basically <laughs> uh, the crew gets tricked into going into Noah's Ark, which Noah's Ark is basically this thing, uh, this area, this location that the Noah used to basically travel around the world at very, very fast speeds. Uh, it is a mystery as to what it is actually or like how they managed to create such a, a unique technology at such a... Uh, early age because it is important to note that this series takes place in the 19th century uh, So this is in the 1800s. It's uh, so it's like more old-school in a way, but it still feels like very newish if that makes sense, but um 
Yeah, so they travel into the Noah's Ark and they fight against a variety of the Noah. You get a fight between Kanda and Skin Boric. Skin Boric is one of, uh, one of the variety of Noah, a very strong one, and it's a pretty crazy fight between Kanda and him. Um, and then as we continue on, basically it's one of those ones where like, oh, just leave me behind, we're gonna do some stuff. Um, you get a fight between uh, Arista, Krori, and Just Devi. Just Devi is basically two different uh, Noah who confuse together uh, because of their bond, is what it's called. Uh, but yeah, they're a really interesting character, but I will talk about that when we talk about the characters. That fight is super crazy, and we get one of my favorite parts in art uh, in all of the series, which I will be showing as I talk about the art later in the series. And finally, we reach Alan versus Tiki Mick and Lavi versus Rhodes. So this Alan versus Tiki Mick fight has been building up uh, throughout the entire series up to this point. Uh, like I mentioned, Tiki Mick is the one who caused Suman to turn into a fallen one, and he just Tiki Mick's just kind of a really messed up person. Uh, really, he's like really evil. Uh, I would say on the level of the Millennium Earl. So his fight between Alan is very like. Uh, it's like just a really important moment in the story. We finally get like, oh, it's my revenge for all the things that you've done to the, the Exorcist, everything you've done to me. Um, this is a really good fight. And then the thing between Lavi versus Rode, Lavi gets trapped into Rode's dreams because that's what Rode has the ability to do. Um, so Lavi has to escape that as things are just going on. <laughs> um, you get a lot of character development throughout this section, um, especially between Lena Lee, uh, what Alan feels about a variety of the things that are going on, how he feels about the Black Order, how he feels about the Noah. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> so after we figure all this out, Alan basically finds out that he's something called the 14th. So um, Alan suddenly has the ability to control uh, Noah's Ark. They basically steal Noah's Ark from Millennium Earl and the Noah after they created a extra Noah's Ark and basically were trying to destroy the current one. Um, but Alan saves it and basically uh, recuperates it, but he doesn't know how. He basically finds a piano and suddenly starts being able to play it even though he's never played the piano before. So we come to find out, we have some information, there is actually a 14th Noah, and his name is the 14th, uh, at least at this point in time. He's known as the 14th, and he's also known as the, there's also a person named the Pianist. So this person, the Pianist, is one of the very, very, very few people who can control Noah's Ark. Only him, Millennium Earl, and Rode actually can control Noah's Ark. So this is a really interesting development, especially for Alan's character, because then, uh, Obviously, being a basically being a Noah is a really bad thing in the <laughs> in the Black Order. Uh, it's seen as really bad. So um, something called Central Agency, which I would uh, basically akin to the Vatican in a way, uh, gets sent to investigate Alan as a character or Alan as a exorcist and Alan as the Fourteenth uh, because they don't want him. Uh, basically taking revenge and or like turning into the 14th and destroying everything. Um, <laughs> so there's this whole investigation part of this uh, leads more into like how Alan is starting to really question everything about the Black Order on how his like thoughts about how things are going about at this point are pretty screwed up, I would say is the best way to put it. So. We get some more information. We uh, we bring in one of the new Noah. Uh, one of the new Noah, Lulu Bell, uh, invades the the Black Order and is basically causing crap to happen and is trying to kidnap Alan at this point and steal back the egg. What the egg is is that the egg is like this thing that shows up uh, that we come to find out is basically an Akuma factory. Uh, it allows them to build and create often, but basically they had it stolen when they were taking the original Noah back or the Noah's Ark back from the new Noah's Ark. So. Lulu Bell is trying to steal it back so that the Millennium Earl can recreate these Akuma really fast and cause a lot of problems for the Black Order. So this invasion is crazy. Um, there's a lot of really good fights. And we get introduced to something called the Level 4 Akuma, which is this creepy looking baby looking thing it's terrifying it's i don't like it <laughs> it creeps me out um but we get this really good fight between the level four akuma and a good chunk of the exorcist so that's a really important moment um and it's just ah it's really intense i think that's the best way to put it but once that is over the black orders like headquarters has been completely destroyed at this point um so they need to find a new place as they are transferring over this is one of the arcs where I have to say I didn't like it. I thought it was very out of place. It felt really weird. Uh, but basically there's this zombie outbreak that comes out and you come to find out it's this thing that Komui was creating and it's a kind of like a drug. And basically what the drug does is um, keeps you working 
uh, even if you're exhausted, so you basically become a zombie. Ha <laughs> ha! Isn't that funny? Uh, and yeah, this arc just goes on too long, uh, and it feels really weird, especially with how serious uh, a lot of the moments were previous to this, especially after the level 4 Akuma stuff. There's just a lot of things that happen in that arc that were really intense, so to have this really weird, uh, I would say mostly out of place uh, moment just feels odd. I, I didn't like it. Um, it's probably my least favorite arc in the entire series. But once we get through with that, we create. They have created a new order HQ, um, and they're building, basically rebuilding all that stuff. And they get sent off. Alan and uh, the crew get sent off to go find a new innocence or a new person, an accommodator, um, or at least what they assume is an accommodator. So they meet this kid, or they try to find this like thief. His name is Phantom Thief G. Um, He's basically has uh, what appears to be an uncanny ability to switch bodies with people uh, while stealing things. So it caused a lot of problem for the um, the government, and the police at the area that they're located at, uh, and they come to find out it's this kid um, that who uh, that who <laughs> they come to see find out there's this kid at an orphanage who is basically controlling all these people. So um, I like his introduction to the story. I think it's really nice that we do get a new exorcist at this point. We're pretty close to uh, catching up with the series. I think we're at volume like 18, somewhere around there, uh, I wanna say. Uh, so we're pretty far into the series at this point. Um, so introducing him is really cool. We come to find out he has a really cool ability, uh, like I mentioned, where he basically, he can send his like, his own body into other humans. Um, but also, you also come to find out as he becomes stronger, he has the ability to uh, take over an Akuma. So he can become an Akuma himself and gain all those abilities as well. So it's really cool. I actually really like his ability. Uh, and I think introducing him at this point in the stage uh, of the series is actually a really nice, refreshing kind of like, thank you, finally something, something new with, uh, uh, with the innocence. So we get this stuff. Then we get introduced to these people called the Thirds. Um, the Thirds are basically these half Akuma, half Exorcist people. Um, they're very strange, they're very out of place in a way, uh, and something doesn't feel right with them because basically Alan's like innocence reacts to them because it's like, oh, they're Akuma, but they're also not. So uh, this part is like, I think where it truly introduces the, what is what is truly good and evil in this world because like, at, from our perspective, from reading from the Black Order, the Millennium Earl is the truly evil one. You know, he's the one who's going to destroy the world, which is totally true. Uh, but we come to find out, like, the Black Order is doing a lot of really messed up things in the background, uh, which is one of those, like, things, I think, one of the themes that they're talking about throughout the entire story is, like... Even in the battle of good and evil, there are still going to be evil things that the good people do and there's going to be good things that the evil people do. Uh, so there's a lot of like nuance to it. It's a lot more than just like basic black and white. There's a lot of gray area on both sides that cause a lot of problems. Obviously, we still want to root for the Black Order, but some of the things they are doing are questionable at best um, and really screwed up at worst. So. It's, it's really interesting to have this kind of stuff added into the story as well. And uh, added in a way that's like, oh, like uh, there's something about it that makes you question everything that the Black Order is doing. However, it doesn't also doesn't change the fact that the Millennium Earl is completely evil. So, you know, now you're just like in this weird moment, like, do I really want to root for either of them? <laughs> um, but really appreciate it, really like it. So after they get introduced, we have this massive battle between the Noahs and uh, the Exorcist. It leads to a lot of casualties uh, on both sides, and basically we get to the point where Alan is starting to have dreams, he's starting to get taken over by the 14th, and he feels like he needs to get out of here before something bad totally happens. So Alan officially leaves the Black Order to go and try and find himself, or to try to find a way that he can escape being the, becoming the 14th, um, it's a really intense moment, <laughs> and really, I think it's, it, we're going into the final arc, or final arcs of this series, or what it feels like, um, as we're going into the last parts of where I'm caught up to, because, uh, obviously the series is not over yet, uh, we get some crazy, crazy things introduced that I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay, that's, that's a lot. But basically, to give you an idea, you come to find out that a long time ago, the Millennium Earl split into two people. So he split into, let me see, I gotta make sure I wrote this down somewhere uh, so that I don't screw this up. <laughs> Alan split himself, or not Alan, excuse me, the Millennium Earl split himself up into two people. 
he split himself up into Nea and Tamana. So Nea, who you come to find out, is the person that is the 14th. Yes, you are right. You are correct. Alan has basically a part of the Millennium Earl inside him. <laughs> um, it is absolutely wild. Crazy, like, drop of information that's just like, whoa, what? <laughs> Um, and Mana, if you don't know, Mana is the name of somebody who took care of Alan way back in the day uh, when Alan was a part of the circus, and it's just like such a crazy reveal at the time. Uh, it still kind of sits with me like as like one of the most ridiculous and like wow moments of the series. I definitely wasn't expecting it to be dropped like that, but was it cool? Absolutely. So <laughs> overall, this story is. There's a lot of nuance that obviously I've been I missed. Uh, I may have missed some spots here and there, but there's just so much to talk about with this story. And I think this story is really, really, really good. Actually, I think uh, the way that the characters are written are fantastic. There are a lot of great relationships created, um, and a lot of like nuance with these characters as well. Um, especially within the story. And I think the story lends itself well to like this pretty like intense kind of moment between good and evil. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of the themes focus around like this good and evil side, like what is what is truly good and what is truly evil because it feels like the good people are doing evil things as well. Uh, and is it worth doing those kinds of things for the sake of saving something, like saving humanity, saving these people? Like there's so much to it and it makes you really think and my head kind of hurts. <laughs> but overall, I really love this story. I think it's really good. Um, I think I was drinking the Haterade back then because like I mentioned, I think just was spending $10 for a volume that came out every like four or five months and then I read it in like a half hour was just not worth it at the time. However, now that I own all the volumes and I have time to do it because I'm a full-fledged adult somewhat, um, it's really great to have read back on it. There's a lot of really great moments like I mentioned. The writing is very, very good. Um, I think it, it, it gives you just enough information so you can kind of put things together yourself, but it isn't overly dropping information on you uh, to be, make you feel like a baby. Like it, Katsura Hoshino never makes you feel like an idiot, which is really great. I really appreciate it when uh, manga don't make you feel really dumb or don't make you feel like they're putting on the training wheels for a bike. Um, so really great. The writing is fantastic. I love this story. I think it did a really good job. My only gripes, I would say, is uh, there are definitely some moments where it becomes a little too comedic for my taste. Uh, I think having comedic moments to break up the tension is fine, but there are definitely some moments where it felt like it relied too heavily on the comedy, like I mentioned with like the whole zombie outbreak uh, arc, if that's what you want to call it. It was just so long and just kind of out there. It felt very out of place, especially with how intense the two arcs around it are. Um, so. It was just a little strange. Uh, but overall, really like the pacing. I really like the writing. I think it's a very good story. All right, now it's time to talk about the characters. So there are a lot of characters in the Gray Man, and I will say I'm not gonna talk about every single one of them because there are a lot of characters that I don't really have much to say about. Uh, so I'm gonna try my best to tackle the main cast, a good chunk of the Noah, and a, a variety of other characters as well. Uh, I might comment on some, maybe like a sentence or two, but they're definitely not gonna be as detailed as some of the main characters. So first up, we have ourselves Alan Walker. He is the main character of this wonderful series, and I think the best way to explain him is that he is precious. He's just um, naive at first, but becomes very learned very quickly. You come to love him. He's a really easy, lovable character. He's caring, he's calm, he's warm-hearted, uh, really cares about a lot. But I, I think what makes him so interesting as a character, as we proceed throughout the entire series, is first, you know, he gets introduced as like this kind of aloof, kind of weird little guy, um, <laughs> has a weird little thing on his arm, does some strange stuff. Uh, but as we come to learn more about him, as we go throughout the story, he is very kind. Uh, he cares so much about the people around him that sometimes he pushes those people out in order to keep them safe, uh, to keep them out of danger, uh, which leads to a lot of problems with um, relationships between his friends um, as we proceed throughout the story. And But he comes to kind of like switch up on that as we proceed throughout the story, like I said. Um, he really is like not necessarily untrusting, but is so protective of the people around him that he pushes them away, but it gradually brings these people back in because he comes to find out what he truly cares about throughout the entire story, and that's the people that he loves and cares for. And it's just like 
I don't know. His character goes through so much, and I, I mean not just as like physically, like getting like the crap beat out of him by a variety of Akuma and other people, but also mentally too. I think he goes through so much um, uh, questioning just authority, questioning himself, questioning the people around him, uh, questioning why all of this is happening in the first place. It is so much, and it's so crazy to think that he's a 15-year-old. Um, <laughs> Eventually he becomes 16, I believe, in the story. Um, but a lot of characters comment on that. They're like, all of this stuff has happened to him, but he's only 15. Can you imagine being a sophomore age, sophomore to junior year in high school, and having gone through a variety of things that Alan Walker has gone through, which, to give you an idea, you know, having basically your identity stripped away from you, uh, being called a traitor, a... Uh, a member of the Noah, having someone who's trying to take over your body, basically, having everyone kind of tear you apart, being like, oh, you need to be this, you need to be that. He's basically trying to uh, satisfy everyone in a way, but also satisfy no one at the same time. So he's just, there's just so much to him that, like, <laughs> it just kind of sucks uh, to watch him go through it because, like, yeah, like I mentioned, there's so much that I could talk about about him. Um, I wrote down and wanted to mention this, but he really goes through it after losing his innocence uh, specifically. I, I, I talked about this when I was talking about the story, but there's just a lot of like connection to his character and also losing his innocence because then he's kind of lost his humanity. He's kind of lost what he has been building up to for his entire life up to this point, uh, becoming an exorcist, you know, having this innocence that's so important to him because it's kind of uh, what allows him to protect the people that he loves. And having to lose it is just like, I don't know, there's a lot... There's so much you could take apart there, um, but his character, he really just, he suffers a lot through it. But after contemplating his role in life, like I mentioned, since it has been so twisted and changed, um, mentioned, like I want to mention, his innocence is named Crown Clown, which I think is like important to know that he's like the king of the clowns. Um, I, I guess you could say there's some kind of like whatever connection between that like oh you know he's just trying to make people happy so he's like that's like his main goal in life is to make people happy which is what clowns are allegedly supposed to do of course a lot of people are very scared of clowns so this is a uh a <laughs> uh, almost a joke in a way where like he is like trying so hard to satisfy everyone else around him that he's not willing to make himself happy uh, or to help himself in any way which i think is just like that's what crown clown is in a nutshell um in, I don't know, <laughs> it just, uh, I, I, I can say a lot about him, but I feel like I'm getting choked up because I don't know what to say about him because there's just so much to say about him. Um, but it's important to note too that he becomes a transcendent one, which is a character or a person uh, slash exorcist that reaches uh, over 100% synchronization, which basically makes him super powerful uh, on a level of a general status, which generals are like the strongest of the exorcist. Um, and then, like I mentioned, as he basically evolves into, like, the 14th, he gains this new ability, too, that allegedly gets rid of evil, which he gets his sword um, that's kind of like a claymore in a way. It's very long, very heavy, uh, and it looks exactly like the Millennium Earls, which, if you were listening to the part in the story, uh, this makes sense because uh, Millennium Earl and him are one and the same. They're basically the same person in a way, uh, but split into two. So... Alan has the opposite sword, which basically can uh, remove the evil, remove the evil from people or the Akuma so it could save their souls or stuff like that. Um, it's really interesting. I don't know, I don't know like, how else to say it. Like, Alan is such a unique character. I, I think he goes through so much throughout the entire story uh, and actually like beneficial and also in a negative way. I think there are a lot of shonen characters that could fall into this trap of just being like, just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. He goes through it. He's a roller coaster. He's a roller coaster throughout the entire story. Of course, he is obviously getting stronger as we proceed throughout the story. That's to be expected. But I think physically, yes, that's happening. But mentally, it's also like just up and down, up and down. Never really having a chance to take a breather, which uh, I think is a great thing about Alan's character, um, is that even going through all of this, he's able to kind of keep his composure, really start caring about others, uh, and really focusing on himself towards the end of the story, which is what we appreciate and what we love about him. Now, I'm gonna talk about some of the other uh, exorcists here on the front. So we have Lena Lee Lee. So Lena Lee is uh, the sister to Kumui, Kumui, who is this guy here. Kumui is the leader of the, uh, or head of the HQ of the Black Order. Um, I don't really know what his true role is. I guess he's like the, he's like the head chief of the science division, but he's also basically just the head of the Black Order HQ. Um, he's an interesting character in himself, but I'll talk about him a little bit later. So Lena Lee, 
Holy crap, Wenneli is a fantastic character, and uh, happy to see a female character in a shonen series actually being uh, genuinely interesting. Um, <laughs> so let me discuss why. So one, she is uh, super strong and super cool. So she has a really cool ability. She has something called the Dark Boots, where basically um, they're like boots that fuse to her legs, and she can like run super fast, has really strong leg kicks. Um, super interesting uh, ability as well. But She's also going throughout throughout the entire story. So her connection, like I mentioned, between Kamui and Lenali, uh, their brother and sister, Lenali gets taken to the Black Order at a young age and is basically experimented on significantly. Um, she's all alone. She kind of loses everyone around her. And Kamui joins um, the Black Order in order to be with her and in order to help her as well. So there's this sense of connection there where Lenali feels bad that she basically dragged her brother into this uh, in order to, like you know, save herself. Uh, but she comes to grow into this and realize that like, it, you know, her brother did that because she, he cared about her, not because uh, she tricked him into coming in or whatever. Like he was brought into it because of her. It was more like he was coming to save her. And so she uh, comes to grow and understand this as she proceeds throughout the story. Uh, her character goes through a lot throughout the story because she has a lot of she has a really strong emotional connection with a lot of the cast. Uh, so having all these people suffering uh, around her is uh, making her struggle to a point where she also loses her innocence. Her innocence actually becomes basically destroyed uh, to a point where she can't even use it anymore. Uh, it's totally useless, and she also feels a lot of what Alan was feeling when he lost his innocence, where she's like, I don't even know what to do anymore because like I feel like my whole my whole purpose was to uh, protect my friends and also to help save the world from all the Dakuma, but now that I can't do that, I can't do either of these things. I'm basically useless and hopeless. Um, and yeah, I think her character really goes through a lot of development throughout this entire story as well, uh, where she comes to... Uh, follow what she has always wanted to do, like what her true duty was. Like, yeah, her duty for sure was like, oh, I need to go out and do missions. But her true duty and her obligation basically is she is going to fight as hard as possible, no matter what, to protect the people that she loves. A lot like what Alan is going through. And I think Lenali also has a very strong character development, like I mentioned. And also her ability evolves too with her, which is really cool. So she basically becomes kind of like this special this special type of um, anti-Akuma weapon known as a crystal type innocence, uh, which is like, it, it's kind of formed out of her blood. So then her like legs become even faster, even stronger. They feel light on her feet. Um, I think it's important to note that's like, uh, her character development with her innocence as well is that her innocence uh, as she mentions early in the series is that her boots are very heavy They always feel like they're really holding her down But after she's had like this character moment where she uh, Realizes like why she's doing it in the first place uh, her boots become light She becomes faster and stronger and that's like it's supposed to be like kind of like this um, Moment of ta-da you finally figured out what you've always wanted to do and now that you have it you're as strong as ever so Lenali's character is flipping awesome. Um, now also just to mention Komui, because I was already talking about him, Komui, like I mentioned, is like the head chief of the Black Order. Um, he's a really weird character, kind of wacky. He's one of those characters that has a minor sister complex, um, but not in like a super weird way. It's just like a very defensive, like he doesn't feel like he has like the, the, the classic trope of like, oh, I love my sister so much that I'm never gonna, like I'm like kind of in love with her kind of thing. You know, that weird trope that uh, is very common in manga, unfortunately. Uh, he has more of like a typical defensive brother trope where he's like, oh, don't let anybody, uh, you know, touch my sister unless like my sister is okay with it, blah, blah, blah. Very defensive of it, but that's also because, like I mentioned, because Lena Lee was pulled from uh, her home and was experimented on to become a, an exorcist. And Komui basically joined the, like, joined the science division in order to find a way to defend Lena Lee, to keep her safe, to keep her, um, you know, protected because they were all that they, they had for each other. It was just Komui and Lena Lee. And uh, it's, I don't know, it's a really good moment. Um, he's basically the comic relief of this entire series. He's very weird, he's very odd. Uh, makes a bunch of stupid, like, useless experiments and <laughs> uh, starts one of the arcs, which is my least favorite arc, but, you know, whatever. Um, but he, overall, he's a funny guy. Uh, but I think he has a lot of really great moments throughout the story as well. He has these moments where uh, he has to really, like, buckle down and realize, like, his job is to... 
uh, proceed with the Black Order. And he really gets to question this throughout the entire series where his, his duty versus his obligation, uh, where his duty is, is like, oh, you know, I need to send out the exorcist. I need to make sure we, we limit casualties. But he's obliged to protect the people around him. Like, he doesn't want to always send out Alan. Uh, he doesn't want to have Lena Lee Alan in danger. Uh, he doesn't want to always be sending out all these people in order to risk their lives to basically fight a never-ending war in his eyes. Um, so watching that, watching him go through all this, watching this duty versus obligation theme, which is really common among most of the cast, which I will be discussing with some of the later characters. But overall, I like Komui's character. I think he's really cool. Now, uh, let's talk about some of the other random uh, science division people, since we're kind of already on it. We have Johnny, Johnny's Johnny Gill. He's uh, kind of like this wacky scientist guy, always looks like he's dead inside, uh, as with most of the science division. But yeah, overall, he's just a guy with a sense of duty. Um, once again, also questioning his role and everything, uh, which is why he proceeds to leave the science division uh, towards the end of the series, uh, towards the end of where we are at currently, uh, to go find Alan after he goes off and, you know, leaves the order to go and try to do, find a way to stop the 14th. So Johnny feels like this obligation to protect the people once again, protect the people around him and to help the people that have always helped him stay safe, stay protected. So um, he has like a really strong sense of duty, a really strong sense of obligation, really cares about the people around him. He has a really, really, really sad emotional moment where he loses his like best friend basically. Oh, it was so messed up. Um, but I like Johnny as a character. I think he's really cool. Uh, we don't get too much about him obviously until like the latest arc. So um, hopefully we get more in the future. Uh, then we have Reaver, who is the uh, the actual head of the science division, allegedly. Um, <laughs> he's pretty cool. Uh, he doesn't get too much about him, but he really cares about the science division. He really cares about the people uh, that he works with. So he always makes sure to protect them, including putting himself in harm's way in front of a Akuma at one point when there's an invasion. It's wild stuff. Reaver's really cool. He was actually one of my favorite characters when I first read the series, and he still is one of my favorite characters to date. Um, after that, we're going to talk about another exorcist. We're going to talk about him. This is Lavi. So Lavi is really freaking cool. He's probably my favorite character in the entire series. And let me tell you why. So Lavi is uh, basically part of this group of people known as the Bookmen. The Bookmen are basically... Um, not curators, but or I guess curators is the right word for it. But they're these people who are basically recording history. So they're doing, they're writing everything about history down, making sure to pick up all of like the little things that are going on across the world, uh, whether good or bad. So technically, Lavi and the Bookman, who is, uh, well, this guy, you can't really see him. He's in the corner here. Uh, but Lavi and the Bookman are supposed to be neutral in this war. Uh, even though Lavi is an exorcist and so is the Bookman, um, they are technically supposed to be like neutral. So they're supposed to be like the people who are always writing down information, even if it's for the good, even if it's for the bad. Um, so they, they pick up all the information. So Lavi is once again also struggling with this duty versus obligation because his duty is he needs to be recording everything, even the bad things, even the whatever. Not really supposed to be developing uh, relationships with people because he's going to be outliving these people for the most part because he's going to be recording information while these people are dying out there in the battlefields. Um, but his obligation is, is like he feels these connections with these people. They are just like him, you know, they're, they're exorcists, they're fighting for their lives. Um, so he feels really connected to them and he's struggling with, is my job really this important where I can't form relationships or like I feel like I need to let these people just do what they want uh, while I have to record information and um, it's it's a lot. Lavi goes through so much. I, I think his character is very unique, um, especially in this kind of story, him being like a neutral character in a way. Um, Eventually he meets up with like the Noah and you come to find out they have information that the Noah are looking for and yeah There's just a lot of really really great moments with Lavi. Uh, I think his weapon is super cool, too So basically he has like this hammer that can extend uh, and he can like summon like elements and stuff like that so uh he like can stamp them basically, so he hits them with the hammer and like the stamp will do something. So whether it's fire or lightning or wind, it's, I don't know, it's really cool. I like his ability a lot. Um, <laughs> I think he has a really cool innocence and his design is super cool. I, I don't know, something about red hair with the, the goofy little scarf and the eye patch. Really cool. I love Lavi. I think he's great. The Bookman as well. I think the Bookman is really awesome as well. He has like a, I don't know what his innocence is technically. It's like kind of like a spike ball, I think is the best way to explain it. He basically can like sh like shoot spines and stuff like that and needles. Um, so overall, he's a really cool character and also a morally great character as well because he's very, he's very much locked in. You know, it's job only. You know, we're not supposed to develop relationships. I don't truly care about these people, or at least that's what he says. Um, 
So he's overall just a really unique and interesting character within the story as well. I think he's really cool and I think he's really important to just the overall story going on because like he's neutral in a way. Uh, obviously he'll fight the Akuma if he's in danger but for the most part yeah he's just kind of like just recording history. Just make sure you're recording history. Make sure you're doing this. So crazy stuff. Um, great characters overall. So I missed one character and I need to, let me see if I can find a better video, like visual of him. Um, here we go. Ah, so we have ourselves Yukonda. So Yukonda, I would argue, is like the main rival character of Alan, which is why they're on the cover here. Uh, Yukonda is a very crazy character. At first, he's your typical whatever, like, I hate everything. I'm a tsundere kind of character. Like, everything sucks. I'm just doing my job. Um, but once again, he's also going through it. <laughs> I think a lot of the characters are going throughout this, this entire series, which is not surprising considering the um, situation they're in, I think is the best way to put it. But Kanda is basically this, this type of person known as the second exorcist. So the second exorcist were these people that were being experimented on uh, way back in the day. I think it was supposed to be nine years ago from the current timeline, I guess 10 um, as time goes on. But he is one of two that have like this basically unique ability um, what's called Sangen Shiki, which he has like basically this like kind of like symbol on his chest uh, and he can use it to heal himself um, and eventually other people that we come to find out. Um, it's really unique. He's got some, he's got like his abilities, basically the sword uh, that he can use. It's really strong, stuff like that. But um, he has a couple of Akuma powers, which is what the second seconds are. Um, he's basically really much associated with someone named, uh, what's his name? Alma. So Alma is like, Another character who is the second, uh, which I will talk about in just a sec. But basically, yeah, um, Yukonda has a really interesting time thinking about, like, why does he care so much about the organization that experimented on him that screwed up his life for the most part? Um, and as you come to find out, it's like, yeah, it's because he feels ob like obligated in a way to do it, to fight, because uh, he feels like he is responsible for Alma's death. Uh, who Alma is his best friend uh, back in the day, but obviously was killed by him in the past nine years ago. And uh, he feels obligated to do it. Like, he feels like there's no escape from it. He feels like he's locked in. He has to fight for the Black Order. Um, but has a really, really great moment with Alan uh, when they're fighting against Alma, because Alma comes back. You come to find out that Alma is the reason why there are the third exorcists. Um, those people I mentioned before that are half Akuma, half exorcist. Um, so they're using like Alma's blood cell, uh, Alma cells in order to create these uh, anti-Akuma people. And it's a lot. I mean, Yu has like this really emotional moment. You come to find out that Yu Kanda and Alma uh, were actually related in the past, uh, where Yu was in love with this woman um, in the past. And you come to find out that her soul was placed into Alma. So the reason why Kanda has such a connection to Alma is because of that. And uh, it's just like, it's so much, it's so sad. Um, but Alan basically lets them have their peace, have their moment, because he sends Alma and Kanda off into their own place so they, they can have their moment. Um, after you come to find out that Alma is basically turning into a, a fallen one and they want to kill him, so uh, let them go. Once again, leading Alan to be basically extradited or to be like looked down upon by the Order and by kind of everyone at this point. So <laughs> um, Alan's sacrifice for you, Kanda, really resonates with Kanda, uh, which leads him back to the Order to go find Alan. And um, their moments together are really funny uh, and actually get really emotional towards the end, uh, or at least towards the end of where we at. I really like Yukonda's character. I really like where he comes, uh, what he becomes eventually. He becomes more, he becomes less of that brooding, like, I kind of hate everything to this more understanding and fighting for justice kind of character. And I really, really like that. Okay, up next, um, let's see. Let's talk about, let's talk about Aristar Krori. So, Aristar Krori, um, <laughs> is a reference to a character or a person named Aleister Crowley. I don't remember what Aleister Crowley is. I probably should have looked that up, uh, but I did look it up because I was like, that's just a really funny reference to make in the first place. Like why, why Aleister Crowley? Um, but yeah, he was like basically this historical writer uh, person. So Aristotle Crowley, Crowley, his name is based off of that. Uh, but Aristotle Crowley basically was this dude who lived in a castle and um, would, have, would basically go and like, come to this world or come out of his castle to eat these people and all the villages like scared of him but they come to find out you come to find out that Aristar Krori basically has anti-Akuma teeth so he has a parasitic weapon type uh like 
Allen, where basically it's connected to their body, uh, literally, so it, it feeds off of the, the human's life force. So his ability is these teeth uh, that basically eat anti akuma blood and strengthens him to become really powerful. So um, his character is uh, really unique, basically. He's like friends with this Akuma, um, or not friends, sorry. He's like lovers with this Akuma girl uh, who's kind of strange, kind of weird. Uh, really feel, you always, you feel something odd about her um, and kind of controlling, but her name is Eliad, or Eliade. I don't know how to pronounce her name. I'm really sorry. Um, but she's an Akuma that basically also helps to like kind of fall in love with Alistair Cory, which is really weird. Um, but it also leads to the idea that the Akuma do have feelings for some reason. Um, so Arista Cory has to kill Eliad at some point, uh, which leads to this whole moment where, like, you know, he's losing his love of his life, the only person that ever cared about him for a long time, um, but then ends up joining the Black Order because, of course, he has an innocence. So he finds a new, like, friendship and bond with these people, uh, these people who are going to care about him. Um, he also burns down his castle as he's leaving, which is like this really important character moment um, because he's kind of leaving the past behind, uh, this really abusive, really terrible past uh, that he wishes to basically reset his life, and which he does uh, throughout the story. He's a really great fighter. He has a really awesome moment that I'm going to be talking about in the art section, um, but he has really cool abilities. I really like him. I think he's super cool, and uh, yeah. Um, up next, we're going to talk about Miranda Lotto, who's right here. So I mentioned Miranda during the story part, but basically Miranda Lotto has a, um, a clock, a clock innocence. Uh, her ability allows her to kind of like re reset time. Um, basically, if you get placed in her circle, any damage or like anything that you've taken uh, heals up. Um, but of course, once her ability ends, uh, all that damage comes back to you in a... Um, comes back in like a couple seconds. So her ability is really flipping cool. It's used in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, Miranda just is a very emotional character. She's really edgy and really sad <laughs> when you first meet her because she's basically reliving her life over and over again. And she doesn't know why, um, or reliving a day over and over again. And that's because her clock innocence is basically reacting to her, uh, saying that she'd rather just like stop, like stop living or whatever, something like that. So her character is like, Interesting as you continue to watch or read through the series. Uh, she really grows as a character She really fights for the people that she loves, um, but she has a really emotional moment, and it's so sad um, Where they're fighting upon this ship when they're going to Edo aka Japan um, And the ship basically gets like totally screwed up by the Akuma getting blasted like the sailors get attacked and stuff like that So you have like this really like really um, sad moment that after the, the stuff happens um the ship, like the ship's crew, is kind of like having a party down, down below, um, and you know that they're gonna die because you know they've already taken too much damage. The the shield is still up, but once Miranda leaves, obviously the ship is gonna die. Um, and the captain and all of them are still there, and they're like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be leaving now. Um, it's gonna be just us. Like we're the only ones who survived, and everyone's like, really? Like out of all of them? So as they're leaving, the sailors, uh, sailor captain, and like her partner. Uh, move them onto the boat and they're like this is goodbye and ah uh, man Lenali has a moment Miranda has a moment they all do because it's just like it's such a strong powerful moment and it's so sad uh, when it happens that like ah uh, the emotional turmoil that uh, Miranda has after this where she's like do I really want to keep doing this do I really want to put all these people um you know, in danger, Lenali, the same thing, where she, like, felt like a, a strong connection with the female captain. Oh, man, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> but overall, I like Miranda's character. She hasn't really done much uh, in the current arc, um, but not really a lot of the characters have. But overall, I think she's a great character as well. So, um, I forgot to grab, like, actual stuff, so I'm, I'm going to have to show uh, characters here and there. But I will be talking about two of the... Uh, Noah, at least the two most important Noah, we have Road Camelot and we have Tiki Mick. So Road Camelot is actually the oldest out of all of the uh, current Noah, or at least mentioned Noah. She's been around for a long time, even though she looks the youngest. But that's because she chooses to look young, because you can tra they can change their uh, faces and stuff like that. But she has a really interesting ability. Uh, she's basically the dreams of the Noah, so she can um, artificially throw you into your into dreams and kind of mess with you. Uh, in a way, she also can open these like doors that allow her to like jump through space and time, uh, which is really interesting. And then, of course, she can drive the boat, uh, or she could drive Noah's Ark. 
So, she overall, she's a really interesting character. She has an infatuation with uh, Alan, which you come to find out sort of why, kind of not. They kind of hinted at it, but basically, like, she's in love uh, with Alan, but also the 14th. She finds him to be really fascinating as a character, or really fascinating as a person, so she has this connection to Alan and the 14th as well. Uh, I'm kind of curious as to where that's going to go as we keep going into this current arc, but... Yeah, uh, overall, I think Rhodes' character is pretty neat. Uh, I think she really, she's really cool. She has some cool abilities. Um, yeah, I don't know. She's fun. And then Tiki Mick. Oh, my goodness. Um, where to start? Uh, Tiki Mick is cold-blooded. <laughs> is the best way to describe Tiki Mick. This guy is super wild. He does not give a crap. Um, he is just like complete evil, uh, really manipulating, cunning, just overall just crazy. Uh, he just sacrifices people for the hell of it, like just does whatever he wants. Um, has a really cool ability too, like basically his abilities are like kind of based off of cards, but he uses like these like uh, butterfly things, that I think he calls like keys or something like that, or T's, uh, I don't remember. But the, basically if those butterflies touch you, you die. Um, so he's really strong, he's really powerful, but he really has like... Um, some interesting moments where, like, his character is going through a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's something about him. And, like, he also is the one that destroys Alan's um, innocence first. So, overall, fascinating character. Super cool. Um, super, like, suave, too. He's so he's such an interesting character because you don't really know where he's going to go. Uh, he actually gets hit by Alan's, like, sword, which makes him lose his, like his evilness for a bit, uh, but I guess it would allow him to awaken to become a true Noah, and yeah, overall, it's some wacky stuff, Tiki Mick is crazy, and overall, a great character. And then last but not least, uh, for now, I also, I forgot, I should probably talk about some other characters here, um, but we're gonna talk about the Millennium Earl. So, the Millennium Earl is, <laughs> oh, um, there's so much you can say about him, but I would say basically he is akin to the world Satan, so he's like the one who's trying to, um, Destroy the world, like I mentioned. He's horrifically evil, extremely cunning. Um, you come to find out he's also known as Adam, who is like the first uh, apostle of Noah, which is also interesting to note too, because I think there's a religious connection here, um, that because he is Adam, the first disciple, it's important to note that when he splits into two, it's kind of like how Adam and Eve were formed, where Adam's rib was taken from him and, and became Eve, at least according to the biblical story, that's how it works. So in that way, Adam and Eve are basically Nea and Manna, um, or Nia, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm sorry. Nia and Mana, and oh my gosh, Millennia Earl's character, like, first is, like, super evil, really just, like, cunning and just, uh, destructive, but as you come to find out, it's just, like, there's, like, a really weird emotional moment towards, like, the end of where we're at right now, 27 and 28, um, where we get more context to who he is, and the Millennium Earl is such a unique and odd character, um, and you just want to, like, see what's going to happen, keeps you at the edge of your seat, um, because it's kind of, like, you're almost sympathizing with him for a sec, which is really strange, considering, you know, that he's, like, the most evil character in the series by far, um, so, <laughs> uh, it's interesting to see where his character is going to go, um, currently, especially because, like, you know, you come, we come to learn that he's, like, like I mentioned, he's one of the, he's one of the original Nea and Mana, um, where he erased his original thing, um, he killed... He killed one of the characters and it absorbed him. Uh, and now he's like trying to almost like find somebody from back in the day. And oh, it's just so much. <laughs> There's so much to it. Um, and it's really emotional. It's really, a, it's really a lot. But basically, the biggest spoiler is is that you come to find out that he is Mana Walker. So Mana, that clown um, that Alan was uh, under for a long time is is the millennium earl eventually but basically the millennium earl has forgotten who he was so when he is mana walker um he's kind of just he just thinks he's a clown so which is like this like whoa bombshell moment um and alan like i mentioned is Nea, so he has Nea's stuff mana is looking for Nea, but he doesn't already know that he had actually killed Nea a long time ago and the reason why alan now has Nea inside him is because like the noah reincarnate themselves within an, a new person uh every I don't know, it's like a, a couple of decades. But knowing that, it's like, whoa, this is this is a lot. This is like bombshell, watershed moment. Like, this is crazy. Um, but yeah, uh, the Millennium Earl is, is a very interesting and just intense character. And I don't, I don't know how to feel about him. I kind of hate him, but also like kind of like him a lot. I think he's a really good villain. Oh, so problematic. But um, overall, a very, very fantastic villain. He's a really great character. I really like him a lot. 
Um, and I actually didn't put him, I didn't bring uh, a picture of him or whatever, but Cross Marion, uh, who is Alan's mentor, uh, is really important to the story as well. He's one of the generals that we first learn about. Um, he has two different kinds of uh, innocence. He basically can use Judgment, which is like this gun, and then the Grave of Maria, which is like this female, like anti akama weapon uh, that sings and she like can destroy stuff. So she's really cool as well. Really great character. Cross is like totally effed up. He's like a totally messed up, uh, very corrupt person. Um, but he's really important in terms of the 14th and uh, the pianist. I think overall he's a great character as well. I really like him. Um, and I kind of wish he was in the story more, but, um, overall, uh, the characters are fantastic. If you couldn't tell by my, uh, outpouring of love for these characters, they go through so much and they have a lot of, like, beautiful character development throughout the entire story and I really, really like all of them. Uh, for the most part, there are some characters, obviously, that I wish I had a little bit more, um, information about them, like a, a couple of the generals, like Zocalo and the, the female one. Uh, I wish we had more stuff about them, but overall, this is a great cast, and I love them so much, and it's so much fun to talk about them and being able to share my love for them, because they are awesome. All right, it's time we get into the art. So, the art is arguably the best part of this entire series. Um, there's so much to love about it. I wrote down, pretty simply, there's some really strong backgrounds from the beginning, which is true across the entire series. There's a good understanding of the human shape and accentuated when creating different people and monsters that fit within the world. A lot of the character designs and the creature designs are done so well, um, and they're also unique as well. Like, there, there's not a lot of, like, repetitive uh, designs, I would say. Overall, I think the art is gorgeous and absolutely wonderful, but I'm going to go into more detail right now. Um, I actually picked out a variety of volumes that I, I think have some of the best moments uh, in terms of the art, so let's get started right now. So first, we have uh, two things from Volume 5. So Volume 5 has uh, a really, really cool moment in uh, the first part right here. So this remarkable scene is so flipping cool. Uh, this is a double page spread where we have like this beautiful explosion. We have really great like... Um, accentuation of the background. We have really good uh, perspective drawn as well. It's a really great moment. It's really cool. Um, I, it just shows like how well she's good at drawing depth, how well uh, like she's good at drawing backgrounds as well, um, and also explosions as well. I think the explosions look really, really cool uh, and really show just how like destructive these moments are. So upcoming next, this moment, oh, this was in volume five as well. Volume five is a really emotional moment where we just get like this really sad, um, intense moment where we see all these like dead characters and dead people uh, in their coffins and you just see like all the emotion in this like in this specific like double page spread these double this double page spread is fantastic and probably one of the best in the series this has remarkable depth um, it, across the board emotional and also just uh, creative depth. Um, I really really love the intense like blacks that we have in the moments to really focus on um, like the coffins up front. Uh, we just get like this like really strong movement going into the back uh, and there's just so much to look at as well. Like there's so much to enjoy. Uh, enjoy. <laughs> um, there's so much to enjoy about the artistic and creative side of this and obviously this is in a very very emotional moment in the story and overall a really really good double page spread. I think it's one of the best in the series. All right, up next, from volume six, we have the mind break section. So um, there's this moment where basically um, he's talking to, he's, he's trying to get Suman to not become a, a fallen one or to save him in a way. And Alan basically absorbs all of the memories of Suman. And it is like, wow, this is really flipping cool. I love that Alan is basically an all white, uh, allowing like the background to pop out. He's a really good use of negative space within him. Um, I really like the, the swirls going on across his entire body. It's not just focused on his brain. Uh, so you could tell that like all of the emotions are hitting at the same time. And it's just really intense, really strong. This is a really good double page spread. I, I cannot say enough how much Katsuro Hoshino has some fantastic double page spreads throughout the series. Okay, up next, from Volume 8, we have The 73rd Night is what I wrote down. So, um, this one's just really cool. I think this one's a really good example of just, like, a really cool character stuff uh, going on. Uh, we have, like, this really awesome, like, movement going on. The smoke slash, like, kind of, like, air stuff is really great at uh, conveying that things are spinning. We have a really good uh, sense of, like, Lavi's character, where he is. Uh, I really like the symbols as well going all the way around. It just looks really cool. I think this is a really great page. 
All right, going into volume nine. So this is the Castle Moon is what I wrote down. Um, once again, another one of those absolutely fantastic use of perspective, use of depth. Um, the use of black too to emphasize like just like this creepy kind of like bubbly movement. Um, and just like the angle that we're at, this is a really difficult angle to draw in terms of perspective. And I think it's done really, really well. This castle looks great. The back, uh, the bottom that's coming up, we have a really nice just sharp black that helps us to pop it out. Uh, really gives us that 3D depth and perspective. Really, really like it. I think this is a fantastic page. Okay, going into volume 12, this is the Blood Armor. So this one I'm going to have to look for real quick because I ran out of bookmarks and I didn't want to keep using napkins. Um, but this is a really great moment where basically um, Aristar is like, like I said, he's, he's learned to protect his friends. So his armor has kind of evolved to uh, reflect that. And it, it is the, a really cool reveal. This reveal is so flippin' awesome. This blood armor is so cool. Um, has like a really nice sense of movement and like color uh, and like use of grays and blacks to be able to make this like kind of liquidy form to it. It is really flippin' cool. The white also helps to reflect and give you those good sense of like popping out um, and also how things are shaped within his wings and his armor. It's really great. I really like this specific panel. Going into volume 13, we have the Tiki Mix reveal uh, with his like new ability. This is one of like the most raw moments in the entire manga. Uh, and I only say that it's because it becomes like this kind of scratchy looking art to it, um, which is really hard to tell here. I, I, maybe I'll bring like a, a copy of uh, it digitally, but this is a really cool moment. Um, and it's just really gorgeous. I just really like that like Katsura Hoshino is willing to experiment with the art as well. I not just always fall into like uh, her really strong color and like uses of black and white, uh, but also being willing to try like different like sketchy styles and more of like this like kind of like raw moment uh, intensity. It's a really good emotional moment and a really great moment in her art. All right, going into volume 15, I have the level four Akuma introduction. So this moment, <laughs> so one, this is creepy as hell. Uh, this like creepy looking thing just moving around the angle. This whole like section right here when he's like getting birthed is really great, but also this. This is a really cool perspective moment where we get like a small with Alan being huge on one page and Tim Campy as well, while also getting a smaller level four this is the introduction of the level four. It's a really great moment, a uh, really emotional moment as well. Like we're getting, we thought the fight was gonna be close to over and it just got worse. Um, so this moment is really great. Uh, like I mentioned, it's got some really good perspective, uh, really cool like use of like large to small, uh, giving you an idea of where the characters are located within this like section in this world. And uh, overall, uh, it's just fantastic. All right, going into volume 20, this is the stop wanting section is what I wrote down. So the stop wanting section, um, this one's just really cool because it's just got a really like epic and strong moment of like Conda showing emotion. I think this is a really good example of like emotional moments that um, like Katsuro Hoshino is willing to convey and is able to convey with some fantastic art. And it also has this really cool creepy looking angel thing on the left side. I don't know, it's just a really good sense of panel. I like it a lot. All right, volume 21. This has the 196 night, which is one of the chapters, and it's just got one of those grotesque monster designs, like I was mentioning. Um, really cool monster designs. This is just really gross and nasty. Um, just absolutely disgusting looking feeling. Um, this was really cool looking at this, like when you're like kind of break it down. Uh, it has some really good form and movement to it, a really good design as well. Uh, really ups the creepy factor uh, specifically, and it just looks really good. I, I think this is a really good monster design across the board and a really good design from Hoshino as always. All right, going into volume 23, we have Konda's Innocence um, once again. So after Konda becomes a crystal type Innocence later in the series, we get this super awesome double page spread uh, where Konda has basically evolved into becoming a crystal type Innocence and has this like absolutely terrifying, horrifying angel looking Innocence thing uh, made, out of her, made out of his blood coming out. It is really cool. This is a great moment. It's just like, um, really cool to see also, like we get to see like the full black for the blood on his arms, going into like this grayscale, um, beautiful reflection, uh, really good highlights. I really like this like double spread. This is a really good double spread. And last but not least, this is probably one of my favorite frames in the entire series. And this is from volume 24. Um, but this frame also does kind of show up in parts. 
But look at this thing. Oh my goodness. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Super beautiful. A perfect example of how depth and perspective is used in art. Uh, using a variety of, uh, not necessarily unique, but very uh, strong and very smart techniques. Um, a really good example of like what I mean by depth and perspective. So when you're looking at this, um, you can see how detailed we get the wheat uh, towards the front of us on this page here. But as you start to move back, you notice how it starts to get a little bit less detail, a little bit less detail, and then we get to like basically nothing um, towards the end. But it's a really great way of explaining like spatial depth, uh, understanding how like the world looks. Uh, as you get further away, it helps to push things back when you start to get less, um, less of that what is it called? <laughs> Why am I blanking on the word? Uh, it becomes less detailed as we as the further we go back, and that's just to uh, accentuate that idea of when you're looking at something, and the further away it is, the harder it is to really get out those like sharp details. So there's just enough uh, details in that building that uh, look great, help it to pop out. But I really like how the wheat really just shows, and it's really moving towards it too, because the wheat is all kind of pointing towards the building, which you know that the building is going to be important. That tree is also going to be important as well. This is an absolutely fantastic panel a uh, really fantastic overall double spread this is one of my favorites and i'm getting goosebumps i'm sweating i love this so very much so overall the art is gorgeous there are so many things you could talk about it you could talk about all the kinds of character designs we could talk about all the kinds of costume designs too they're really cool they're really unique uh really fun as well uh, i think some of the akuma designs are also really well done uh there's so many to talk about but i don't really know how to talk about them because it's just like if i went into every single akuma design it would take forever but there are so many good ones uh definitely just worth checking out for yourself um it's great stuff so my verdict on all of the gray man the gray man is a must read i think this is one of the best shonen series i've ever read i would say um i would say it's somewhere sitting in my top 30 to 50 i'm not really sure where i would put it uh to be completely honest i think it does a lot of things very very well uh and that's not even talking about i forgot to mention the cover designs the cover designs are all really gorgeous uh just in general but Going back to what I was saying, my overall verdict, I think this is really good. I would probably give it like somewhere between like an 8 to a 9 out of 10. Uh, I think it's really worth a read. Um, just for the characters alone, I mean, I think the characters are really well done. The themes are really well thought out and uh, actually like matter to the story and how the characters react to things. I think overall, we have some great character development. We have some great art across the board. The art is fantastic from start to finish, um, at least current finish. <laughs> and I'm super excited to keep reading this series as we read it. So um, I think in comparison to how I felt about it before, didn't like it before as much, but I definitely really like it now, and I understand the hype. Whew. All right, so that is it for this The Gray Man review. This was really long. This took a long time, but that's because I really wanted to make sure that I gave a lot of information, uh, really gave my true opinions about this entire series. I think this series is really cool, and I think it's worth putting this much effort into a review. I feel like the short reviews, uh, like my, my reading logs, I really enjoy doing them, and I do really enjoy doing my... Um, my FEIs, but I think doing a full series review is really fun too because we could really go into like how certain things, re like how I react to certain things, uh, why certain things matter throughout the story. It's just really fun. Um, and I'm really glad with how this came out, I, I think. <laughs> I guess when I'm editing it, I might have a different opinion, but um, this was a really fun video to make. I really hope you enjoyed it. I really hope you watched all the way through. Um, how do you feel about De Grey Man? Let me know in the comments below. I'd like to know what you guys think about this series. If you've ever read it, watched it, whatever, I don't care. Uh, just let me know how you feel about it. Uh, I'd love to see what you guys think about it. And you know what to do. You can like, you can comment, you can subscribe. Those are all amazing things. I really appreciate it when you do those fantastic things. And uh, yeah, if you didn't do any of that, thanks for watching a very, very long video about the Gray Man. Um, yeah, that's about as much as I could say. So I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.